Shalom. I'm going to be doing a teaching tonight on showing you Yeshua in the Torah. To begin with, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 40 and verse 8. It says, Psalm 40 verse 7. Psalm 40 verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. That verse is quoted in Hebrews in chapter 10 in verse 7, referring to Yeshua, that in the volume of the book it is written of him. So the entire Bible is written about Yeshua. In traditional Christianity, we kind of view the Bible as the Old Testament is God the Father, and the New Testament is Yeshua. So when we read Lord or God in the Old Testament, we kind of write in our minds God the Father. And so when we have this perspective of the Bible, it's going to cause us to partially understand the Bible and then ultimately misunderstand the Bible. Now Yeshua said in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, these are the words that I spoke with you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So he said that the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms are written of him. If you had asked most Christians how might the Old Testament be written about Yeshua, they might say, well, you know, he was prophesied to come in Isaiah 53 or, or born of a virgin in Isaiah 7. And, and, you know, Psalm 22 prophesied him dying on the cross. They might have some references like that. Maybe other ones like he was a type of Moses, he was a type of Joseph. But they don't see that it's written about him only from the point of referencing or, or referring to him either in the future or in type and shadow. Not that it's literally itself um, written of him. So now we go to John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. And here Yeshua is having conversation with Jews. And these Jews that he's having conversation with do not accept, do not believe that he is the Messiah. And they believe in following the Torah. They don't believe that he's the Messiah. So this is what he said to them. In John chapter 5 verse 46, Yeshua said, If you had believed Moses, or, unless, or if you believe what the Torah says, you would believe in me. For the Torah wrote of me. It, the Torah, is written of me. So they said, we believe in the Torah. And he says, no, you don't believe the Torah. Because if you believe the Torah, you would believe in me because the Torah is written about me. That's one point. The second point he made is, verse 47, if you do not believe his writings. Well, Christianity doesn't believe his writings in the fact, in the sense that they don't believe that it pertains to them. So it's in their Bible, so they carry around the Bible, but it really they say, well, that doesn't pertain to me. So even though they carry around a Bible that contains the first five books, they say it doesn't pertain to them. So um, in essence, they don't believe in it, meaning for today. So he says now in John chapter 5, verse 47, if you do not believe his writings, how? Will you believe mine? So he says in order to basically understand and believe what he's teaching and what he's saying, it's rooted in the Torah. But we try to understand what Yeshua said without the root or the basis and the foundation for what he's saying being in the Torah. And so now, based upon that in the volume of the book it is written of me, the Torah of the Prophets and the Psalms is written of me, if you had you believed Moses, you would believe in me, now we're going to try to look at how 
and in what context, in what way, the Torah is written of him. If you would ask most Christians, who created the heavens and the earth? They'd say, well, God. Well, what do you mean by God? Well, they, when they say God, they really mean God the Father. So when they read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, they read God the Father because they've been trained. The Old Testament is God the Father. The New Testament is Jesus, or Yeshua. Yet, if you would ask most Christians, what is the most read book of the Bible by Christians, almost unanimously, Christians will say, the book of John. So I agree. The book of John is most likely the most read book of the Bible by Christians. So, let's say they read the book of John. That means they'd have to begin in chapter 1. And if they read the first three verses, what would they learn? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So the subject is the Word. That's the subject of verses 1 and 2. The Word. And the Word is Yeshua. He's called the Word in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. So he's the Word. So what does it say in verse 3, given that verses 1 and 2, the subject is the Word? All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Who's Him? The Word. Because it says in verse 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Who's Him? That was life, and the life was the light of men. The Word, Yeshua. All things were made by Him. Well... In case we read too fast, God in His mercy gives us a second chance. Because it says in verse 10, John chapter 1 verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. So who's the one that was in the world that the world didn't know, because the one that was in the world that the world didn't know made the world? So my question is, because, you know, I started going to church when I was five years of age and pretty much made it every Sunday. And so I lived my life in church, going to church, being around church, having the Bible taught. And so I know what church people think and how they view things and how they see the Bible and what they're taught to understand. And so most Christians don't view that Jesus, Yeshua, created the heavens and the earth. But why don't they understand that if the book of John is the most read book of the Bible by them, and twice in the first ten verses it says that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth? Either they're programmed wrong, or they don't pay attention to what they read. But furthermore, Paul states the same thing. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 16. And verse 1 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Well, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? That's Yeshua. Verse 16, For by Him, that is the image of the invisible God, for by Him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him, and for him. So, Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Well, who was it that made covenant with Abraham? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, And to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He doesn't say seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed which is Christ. So, what point is Paul trying to make when he says, it does not say seeds, but seed? He's referring to Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. And in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, it says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto you, into your seed after you. Aren't we told 
in the New Testament that the seed is the Word of God? The seed is the Word of God. The sower sows the Word. And, and the Word is the seed. And Yeshua is the Word. So the promise is made to Abraham and his seed. The seed is Christ. Well, then it goes on to say in Galatians 3.29, If you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed in an error according to the promise. That verse says, if I'm Christ, if I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, I'm Abraham's seed. Well, how do I become Abraham's seed? By believing in Yeshua as the Messiah. Well, the only way that that can be is the following. Yeshua made covenant with Abraham. And when I accept Yeshua as my Savior and Lord, I enter into covenant with Him. The Bible describes it as a marriage covenant. Yeshua is in covenant with Abraham. I'm in covenant with Yeshua. Now, I inherit the covenant that Yeshua made with Abraham. We, we should be able to understand this simply when um, two get married... The one spouse inherits the other spouse's family. You, 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 you get what comes with the covenant. Yeshua made covenant with Abraham. We made covenant with him. So we inherit the covenant that Yeshua has with Abraham. We can see this another way. In Genesis chapter 17, in verse 1, it says... And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto him and said, I am Almighty God. In Hebrew, El Shaddai. So the one that spoke to Abraham said that his name is El Shaddai, Almighty God. What is it said about Yeshua in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8? I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending. So... Alpha and Omega is the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet would be Aleph and Tav. So, I'm the Aleph and Tav, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. I am Alpha and Omega, the Almighty. Yeshua is the Almighty, or the Almighty God. And so, it was Almighty God that appeared to Abraham. And so... It was Almighty God who made that covenant and walked between the pieces. Yeshua walked between the pieces. If you study blood covenant, if you break blood covenant, the party that breaks blood covenant must die. So where in the Torah is it shown that Yeshua must die? Well, through the blood covenant he made with Abraham, because Abraham and, and his seed didn't keep their part of the bargain. And so they deserve death, but Yeshua, in a blood covenant agreement, I can take on, in the blood covenant, there's an exchange of garments. In marriage, you know, do you take her? The, does, does, does she take him? So you exchange. You exchange garments. What is his is hers, and hers is his. That's a blood covenant. And so he, so he can cover for her. She can cover for him. So Yeshua can cover for Abraham, who, in his seed that broke the covenant, how does he cover? Well, you deserve death, but I'll die in your place. And so it's, it, it's in the covenant that was made with Abraham where we see the basis by which the one that made the covenant, Yeshua, must die. And so Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Yeshua made... Covenant with Abraham. Who's the one that appeared to Moses at the burning bush? It says in Exodus, in chapter 3, and verse 2, reading from the King James, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And so the one that appeared to Moses at the burning bush is the angel of the Lord. Not God the Father. The angel of the Lord. Well, the Hebrew word that's translated as angel is malach. And malach means a messenger. And so, 
when most people read the word angel, what comes to their mind is Gabriel or Michael or someone like that. Gabriel or Michael didn't appear to Moses. Um, it was the messenger of Yahweh. And who's his messenger? It's Yeshua. And actually in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7 in verse 38, it says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness, the angel which spake to him, Moses, in Mount Sinai. The New Testament says the angel that spoke to him at Mount Sinai. Well, that's the messenger. So who's the messenger that spoke to him? Yeshua. Now, this messenger is having a conversation with Moses, and we're told how the conversation goes. And in verse 4, Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So the messenger of Yahweh is called Yahweh. The messenger of Yahweh is called Elohim, or God. So we can see here in the Torah that the messenger is God. So the doctrine that the Messiah is God did not come from the Catholic Church. And so I've heard those to say, you know, the belief that the Messiah is God is pagan. It's not pagan. It's the Torah. The messenger of Yahweh is, is Elohim and is Yahweh. So now, the messenger of Yahweh is speaking with Moses, and Moses asks the messenger of Yahweh, What's your name? He says, I am that I am. So what's Yeshua saying? Bef in, the, the, uh, in the book of John, Before Abraham was, I am. He was revealing himself as the I am, that I am. Then he would make statements like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. He was declaring that he is the I am that appeared to Moses. And then he said this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. Say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, that means the messenger of Yahweh is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial for all generations. Now, when Jacob gave the birthright blessing to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, this is what he said in Genesis chapter 48 and verse 16. The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads. The angel which redeemed... Who is the angel that redeemed him? Who is the messenger that redeemed him from all evil? The same messenger that appeared to Moses. And so Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. He made covenant with Abraham. He appears to Moses at the burning bush. And we're going to go to Judges. In chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bohem and said, Now, let's pay attention to what the angel of the Lord said. Once again, the word angel is, in Hebrew, messenger. The angel of the Lord, or the messenger of the Lord, said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and brought you into the land. I swore to your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. The messenger of the Lord that said that he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. The messenger of the Lord said, I made a covenant with the fathers. And the messenger of the Lord said, I'll never break my covenant with you. Well, who's the messenger of the Lord that made um, covenant with the fathers that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? It's Yeshua. So Yeshua brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. So when we think it was God the Father that made covenant with Abraham, God the Father that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, we misunderstand our Bible because now we put God the Father's over there, that's old, 
and Yeshua's the New Testament, that's new. And so then who defeated Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea? In Exodus in chapter 15 and verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host has he cast in the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. Who did it? Verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. Who's the right hand? Yeshua yeah. is the right hand of the Father. He's the right hand. So it was the right hand that defeated Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. And that was Yeshua that defeated Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. So, who brought the children of Israel into the Promised Land and gave them victory over their enemies through Joshua? Well, I remind you what it said in Josh, uh, Judges, Judges chapter 2, verse 1, that the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord said that I brought you in the land what I swore to your fathers. So now we go to Psalm 44, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 44, verses 2 and 3. How you did drive out the heathen with your hand and planted them. How you did afflict the people and cast them out. They did not get the land in possession with their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them. But your right hand and your arm because you had favor upon them. So it was the right hand and the arm of the Lord that defeated the enemies of the children of Israel into the promised land. And so Isaiah 53, as we know, is written about Yeshua. And how is Yeshua introduced? In Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So what does it say about the arm of the Lord? Verse 3, He was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And so Yeshua is the right hand and the arm of the Lord. So right hand and arm in Hebrew thought represents power, strength, deliverance, victory. And so it's a way of expressing those things. So Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Yeshua made covenant with Abraham. Yeshua brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Yeshua appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Yeshua defeated Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Yeshua defeated the enemies of the children of Israel in the Promised Land. Are you seeing a pattern? And so, what's the next item? Is... Who led the children of Israel in the wilderness? They were led by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Exodus, in chapter 13, in verse 21, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. You go by day and night. All right, they were led by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So in Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 through 17, we're, giving, we're given a term for the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. It says in Exodus chapter 24, verse 15, And Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount. The cloud covers the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode on Mount Sinai. The cloud is called the glory. And then it says in verse 17, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. 
The glory of the Lord is a cloud and a devouring fire. The cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is called the glory of the Lord. And so now we go to uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. It says, The city, that is the new Jerusalem, had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light. The glory of the Lord lights the new Jerusalem. The Lamb is that light. So Yeshua, the Lamb, is the glory of the Lord, and the children of Israel were led by the glory of the Lord, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That is Yeshua. So now we see the pattern. Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Yeshua made covenant to Abraham. And Yeshua appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Yeshua led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Yeshua defeated Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. And Yeshua led the children of Israel in the wilderness by the cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. So, who gave the Torah then at Mount Sinai? And so, that is Yeshua. And so, we want to see this from the New Testament. But in order to believe that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, in the New Testament, there's a prerequisite, and that is, you must believe that Yeshua is the Savior, and that He saves people from their sins. So we're going to first establish that. Matthew, in chapter 1, and verse 21, says, And she, Mary, shall bring forth a son, and you will call his name, in Hebrew, Yeshua, which means salvation. So, you're going to name him salvation. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. And then, in Luke, chapter 2, in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So, Yeshua is our Savior. He saves his people from their sins. So now, we go to James chapter 4, verse 12. We read the first part of the verse in James chapter 4, verse 12, which says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save. The one that saves, that's Yeshua, he saves his people from their sins, is also the lawgiver. You can also see this in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12 if you pay attention to what you're reading. We're going to begin by looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. It says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel, so, what's the subject of verse 24? The subject is Yeshua, and the verse tells details about him, but it's Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant. So, it's the subject Yeshua, and then verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaks. Who's him? The previous verse, it's Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant. Don't refuse him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on the earth, so Yeshua the mediator of the new covenant spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the whole earth. Whose voice shook the whole earth? Yeshua the mediator of the new covenant. But now he is promised once more. So when did his voice shake the whole earth? Well, in Exodus chapter 19, and verse 18. Exodus chapter 19, verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of the furnace, and the whole mount quaked 
greatly. His voice then shook the whole earth. So Hebrews 12 says Yeshua the creator of the heavens and the earth. No. Hebrews 12, yeah, it does say that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse. And Hebrews chapter 1, it says that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews chapter 12 says that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. James 4.12 says the lawgiver that is able to save. That's Yeshua. Gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. Acts chapter 7, verse 38 says the angel which spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai that angel's messenger that's Yeshua so Acts 7:38 Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai Hebrews 12 24 through 26 Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai James 4:12 Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai and so now we're going to look at Isaiah in chapter 33, no, that's not right, we're going to look at Isaiah in chapter 33, yeah, I was right, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. It says, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That verse makes four claims regarding the Lord. One of the claims is that He saves us. Well, who's the one that saves us? He's our Savior. We've gone over that. That's Yeshua. So, uh, the one that saves us it says he's our judge. Is Yeshua our judge? Well, it says in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, and verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to all that he has done, whether it be good or bad. So, if we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, then he's our judge. So, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, the one that saves us is also our judge. But the one that saves us that our judge is also our king. Is Yeshua our king? It says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he's our king. So Isaiah 33 verse 22 says, The one that saves us, that is our judge, that is our king, is our lawgiver. So Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And so, key to understanding your Bible and seeing how Genesis to Exodus... <laughs> How Genesis to Revelation is one book. The key to seeing how this is one book is seeing that it's all written about Yeshua. In the volume of the book, it is written of Him. That if you chop the book up and you say, well, that's God the Father in Israel, and this is Yeshua in the church, you won't understand your Bible. Because you don't know who Yeshua is. Because you don't see Him in the Torah even though he said that the Torah is written of him. Not alluding to him, not a type and shadow about him. He is the creator. He did make covenant to Abraham. He did bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He did speak to Moses. He did defeat Pharaoh. He was the cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. So once we realize and understand that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, is Yeshua going to give a Torah? and then die to do away with the Torah? Is he going to do away with something that he gave? Because basically what's said about the Torah within Christianity is its bondage. Well, if Yeshua gave the Torah, then, then he's giving you bondage. And so if the gift is bondage, then the giver is bondage as well. But Yeshua is not bondage. And neither is his Torah bondage, because it says in James, 
chapter 2, that whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues thereon, and not be a forgetful hearer. And so James calls the Torah liberty. And so um, that's because Yeshua himself is our Jubilee. He is our liberty. He's the one that sets us free. And so the problem wasn't with the Torah or the giver of the Torah. The problem was with the receivers of the Torah. And the problem with the receivers of the Torah was their hearts. That biblical history's prophecy in the Torah was written on tablets of stone. That's a prophecy that the Torah would be written upon a stony heart. And so what's the characteristic of a stony heart? A stony heart does not want to follow the Torah. And Zechariah, in chapter 7, in verse 11, it says, But they refused to hear. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they would not hear. They made their hearts as adamant stone. They made their hearts as adamant stone, lest they should hear the Torah and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in His Spirit by the former prophets. So a stony heart won't hear the Torah. And so the problem was with the receivers, the stony heart. And so, therefore, in order to please the lawgiver, Yeshua, the receivers had to go through a heart surgery. And we have to remove the stony heart, and we need to put a new heart in there. That's a, that's a heart that will want to hear and follow the Torah. And so, the new covenant is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, which says, The days come, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now this new covenant, verse 33, is the following. I will put my Torah in their inward part, and I will write it, the Torah, in their hearts. And when I do, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Do you see the phrase, I will be their God and they will be my people? That's phraseology of a marriage. I will be their God, they will be my people. So he's marrying his people on the basis that his Torah is written upon their heart. So how is he going to write the Torah on their heart? By his Spirit. By his Holy Spirit. So he has to perform heart surgery on the stony heart. So that's why it says... In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'm going to take away the stony heart, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. That's the new covenant. And I'm going to put my spirit in you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and do them. The purpose of the indwelling Holy Spirit is to cause you to walk in my statutes and judgments to do them, to follow the Torah. But Christians say, I have the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit doesn't tell me to follow the Torah. This says I'm going to put my Spirit in you, and the Spirit is going to cause you to walk in my statutes and my judgments to do them. So there's either one of two things when they say the Spirit doesn't tell me. Either it's through their intellect and they've been taught wrong, so they're speaking intellectually in ignorance, or they got some other spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, in John chapter 16, verse 13, I like to believe, by the way, that they're speaking in ignorance. In John chapter 16, verse 13, um, it says... When the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you in truth. 
He will show you things to come. He will speak of me. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, but what is truth? Psalm 119, verse 142, says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. Psalm 119, verse 151, You are near, O Lord, all your commandments are truth. The Spirit of truth, what's truth? John 14, verse 6, Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeshua is truth, the Torah is truth, the commandments are truth. Yeshua gave the Torah, Yeshua and the Torah are one and the same thing. The Torah is the Word, Yeshua is the Word. And so you cannot separate Yeshua from His Torah and His commandments because they are one and the same thing. And you follow Yeshua and His commandments by His Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth. So the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in truth. That means the Holy Spirit is going to tell you that Yeshua is the Messiah. The Spirit of Truth will lead you in truth. The Holy Spirit will tell you He's the Messiah and follow His Torah. And so, um, we are saved by grace through faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We're saved by grace through faith. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But that is not a brand new, unique, new covenant, new testament doctrine. Because what we teach is, somehow we say, that, um, um, Israel's sins were forgiven somehow by blood, uh, the bulls of bloods and goats, uh, uh, the, the blood of bulls and goats, and we have we have a different way in the New Testament. It's, it's the blood of Yeshua, but in the New Testament, we're saved by grace through faith. I'm going to show you that the Torah teaches that you're saved by grace through faith. So in Exodus in chapter three, in verse twenty-one, it says. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it will come to pass that when you go, you will not go empty. The word favor is the Strong's number 2580. It's the Hebrew word chain, which that word in the King James that here in Exodus 321 is translated as favor is translated as grace in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Noah found grace grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I'm going to give this people grace in the sight of the Egyptian. It will come to pass that when you go, you will not go empty. So he said the way that they're going to be brought out is by grace. Did they deserve it? Did they deserve to come out of Egypt? Were they so doing everything so right and so obedient that they deserved it? No, they didn't deserve it. So it was by grace. But grace alone didn't bring them out of Egypt. It required faith. What was the faith? Faith is doing what God says and believing what God says. What did they have to do? They had to put the blood of the Lamb on the, on the doorpost. So, when they by faith put the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost in grace, now they came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt by grace through faith. And so, then, um, why was it an act of faith? Because in Egypt, Pharaoh was regarded as a god. And when you put the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, you are rejecting Pharaoh as God. And you better be right, and you better have heard correctly, and that better be the, the, the true messenger of God, Moses. And there really better be the God that he's speaking about, because if you're wrong, you're dead. Pharaoh's going to kill you. And so that's why it was such an act of faith. And, and the people had to make a public proclamation. That's why we confess before men that Yeshua is Lord. And so they were saved by grace through faith. Notice they were first saved by grace through faith. After they're saved by grace through faith, then they came to Mount Sinai and were given commandments regarding how they were to live their lives once they were already saved by grace through faith. The commandments were for a saved people. 
to tell them how they were to live their lives on a daily basis to please the one that saved them by grace through faith. So that's what the Torah teaches. So what does Paul say then in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 after he says we're saved by grace through faith? He then says in verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Messiah Yeshua unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works. But he just said that we're not saved by good works. After we're saved by grace through faith, we're supposed to do good works. What's good works? Good works means you don't sin. Good works means you love others. You care for others. You help the needy. You help the poor. Those are good works. They don't save you, but they are a response to being saved. And so then, Paul, what he said in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, he reiterates in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, verses 28 through 30, paraphrased, he said that both Jew and non-Jew are justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without your own merit. And then he says in verse 31, and, and this is a verse that I never, I honestly never once heard quoted in church. Um, Paul says in Romans 3.31, do we, that's Jew and non-Jew, do we make void the law through faith? Make void means to do away with it. Make void means it's nailed to the cross. Do we make void the law through faith because we're saved by grace through faith? So, that is the question that much of Christianity says. Paul taught that, we're, that, that because we're saved by grace through faith, we don't follow the law now. But he asked the question, do we make void the law through faith? Then he answers the question, God forbid we, Jew and non-Jew, we establish the law. I've heard people say, well, that's not for me, I'm not Jewish. He didn't say, it's for you if you're Jewish. He says, we establish the law, Jew and non-Jew. And so, now, what does the Torah uh, say furthermore about our righteousness? In uh, Deuteronomy, that would be 5th Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 9, and verses 5 and 6. It says, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, It's not for your righteousness or for your uprightness of heart do you go to possess the land. It's because of the wickedness of the nations that are there. Also, that he might perform the word which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So why are you coming to the land? Because... Yeshua said, I'm going to be faithful to fulfill my covenant. That's why you're coming in. I'm going to, I'm going to um, be faithful to my covenant. And also because the nations that are in the land, they're wicked. Those are the two reasons. It's not because of, of your uprightness. It's not because of your goodness. So now we read the next verse. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God gives you not the good land to possess it, because of your righteousness, because you are a stiff-necked people. Um, so, uh, it was by grace. And it was not because they deserved it. And so now, that's what the Torah says. What does the prophet say? So, um, we are going to go to... We're going to go to... Ezekiel, and we're going to go to chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, and we're going to begin in verse 12. Ezekiel 33, verse 12. Son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of of the righteous. The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he will not fall in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he will live, 
If the righteous trusts in his own righteousness and then sins, all of his righteousness will not be remembered. For that he has sinned, because of his sin that he's committed, he will die. So the Ezekiel says, you're not righteous. You don't have your own righteousness. If you're righteous in the, in the first sin that you sin, you deserve to die. So when Paul says it's not by own merit that we're saved, and it's not by our own righteousness, well, that's what the Torah and the prophets say. He's not saying something that's, that's in contrast to the Torah and the prophets. He's saying, and he's teaching what the Torah and the prophets say. So, the Holy Spirit was given so that his Torah would be written upon our heart, and that's the will of God. Psalm in chapter 40, in verse 8. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yes, your Torah is within my heart. The Torah in our heart is the will of God. And the Torah in our heart is the new covenant. So, the will of God is the new covenant. Through Yeshua and through His shed blood. That is the will of God. Well, you know the testimony of Paul that before he became a believer in Yeshua, he grew up following Pharisaic, or today we might call it Rabbinic Judaism. And in Rabbinic Judaism, the way you follow the Torah is your rabbi is your authority. And you do what your rabbi says. And so that's how Paul was taught to follow the Torah. But then he came to faith in Yeshua, and this is how he testifies he follows Messiah in Romans in chapter 7 and verse 22. Paul says, I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man. What's the inward man? It's the one that has the indwelling Holy Spirit. So he says, I delight following the Torah by the Holy Spirit. And so, the, 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 uh, the issue that Yeshua had with the Pharisees and the issue that Paul had in his letters was not if you should follow the Torah, the issue was how to follow the Torah. And we see this issue in Galatians and, and elsewhere. That, for example, in the book of Galatians, Paul says, how is it that you started out in the spirit and you're now in the flesh? Well, um, we read in the flesh as following the Torah. But Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. <coughs> well, let's go back to Romans chapter 7. He says in Romans 7, verse 12, The Torah is holy, the commandment holy, just and good. He just said the Torah is holy and good. Now in verse 14, Romans 7, 14, he says, We know that the Torah is spiritual. Christians don't call the Torah spiritual. But he says we know it's spiritual. So now he says in Romans 8, verse 6, To be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life. Well, what is it to be spiritually minded? Well, the Torah is spiritual. To be spiritually minded is to follow the Torah by the Holy Spirit. That's to be spiritually minded while believing in Yeshua. And so then, he says in verse 7, Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is an enemy against God. In the carnal mind, that is logical reasoning, human reasoning, you might say Greek thinking. Human reasoning. It's not subject to the law of God. The carnal mind is an enemy against God because it's not subject to the law of God. Your human reasoning mind won't, and in, in your flesh, won't cause you to follow the Torah. So, so now he says the carnal mind is an enemy of God. It's not subject to the Torah of God. Then he says in verse 8, So that they that are in the flesh... Now, who did he say is those in the flesh? Those that have a carnal mind and those that don't follow the Torah are they that are in the flesh. They cannot please God. 
And so then he says in Romans 8, 14, as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, those in the flesh are not subject to the law of God, so um, if you're a son of God, you're following the Torah by the Spirit. And so, um, when Paul in Galatians said that if you start out in the Spirit, well, how did they start out in the Spirit? In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, in verse 3, it says, at the end of the verse, No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Well, the Galatians believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And this says, you can't say that except by the Holy Spirit. So they started out in the Spirit to be able to say that Jesus is the Messiah, that Yeshua is the Messiah. And then he says that you continue in the flesh. Well, the issue in the first century, and you can see it in the book of Acts, if you read the entire book of Acts, um, um, they go from city to city, and in the synagogue, there's Jews and non-Jews in the synagogue. So in the synagogue, they're hearing the Torah. They're being taught the Torah, Jew and non-Jew. Well, is every synagogue and every city believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? No. And so, what Torah are they being taught? Through whose eyes? Through whose perspective? The Pharisees. And so, um, what Paul was coming against was not if you should follow the Torah, but the proper way. He was coming against those that started out in the Spirit, believed that Yeshua was the Messiah, and they were trying to follow the Torah through the teachings of the rabbis and the Pharisees, which is called the Oral Law. And um, in certain dimensions, the, the influence of how the rabbis taught the Torah in a particular area of Peter's life was a hang-up for him as well. Because it says in Acts, in chapter 10, this is the chapter on Peter's vision, and um, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Peter said to them, you know, you know that it is an unlawful thing, a violation of the Torah, you know it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company with him of another nation or a non-Jew. You know that it's a violation of the Torah for a Jew to eat with a non-Jew. That's, that's what Peter said. It's a violation of the Torah for a Jew to eat with a non-Jew. Read the entire Torah. Nowhere does it say that a Jew can't eat with a non-Jew. But who teaches that a Jew cannot eat with a non-Jew? The Pharisees. And the Pharisees teach and that, that a Jew cannot eat with a non-Jew is, is the oral interpretation of the rabbis called the oral law. So what, what was being fought with is do you, do you believe in, when you believe in Yeshua, do you follow his Torah by his spirit? Or do you follow the Torah according to the teachings of the rabbis? And Paul grew up with the teachings of the rabbis, and he strongly rebuked those who believed in Yeshua that sought to follow the Torah according to the interpretation of the rabbis, and not according to the teachings of the Messiah, and not according to Messiah's spirit. And so that was the issue. Now, because we don't know Pharisaic belief, most Christians don't know that, that Judaism teaches that there was a written law and an oral law given at Mount Sinai, and that the authority of the interpretation of the written law was the rabbis say, or the Pharisees say, was given to them, and God gave them the authority to teach the instruction of the written law, and their instruction, which they say, the details of it were handed down from generation to generation orally. So they say that the oral law, which is written down in the Talmud today, that that, that is the law, and that is what must be followed, is the teachings of Orthodox Judaism, even today. So most Christians don't even know that. 
And so therefore, when they read about the issues of the law, they, they don't even think that they're debating the written law. The Pharisees are advocating the written law, and Yeshua is saying, no, it's the, the, the Pharisees are advocating the oral law, and, and Yeshua is saying, no, it's the written Torah by my Spirit. So, for example, there's this issue in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 15, where it says in verse 1, Then came Yeshua, scribes and Pharisees, which were from Jerusalem, saying, So they asked Yeshua, the Pharisees asked Yeshua, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? The tradition of the elders isn't the law. The tradition of the elders is the rabbi's interpretation of the law, which is called the oral law. And they say the oral law was brought down by tradition from generation to generation. It came from our fathers. So he says, Why do you disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands before they eat bread. Even in today, Orthodox Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism says, You must wash your hands before you eat. That's oral law. And so, Yeshua did not teach his disciples to follow that oral law. And so the Pharisees said, well, why aren't you following the oral law? Now, his reply is, why, why through your interpretation do you violate the written law to honor your mother and your father? And then we see in Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 37, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went and he sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Why did the Pharisee marvel that Yeshua didn't wash his hands before he ate? Because according to oral law, the rabbis, following the law is washing your hands before you eat. And so they thought, well, you're, you're a good... The Pharisee says, well, I'm sitting here with a good Torah observant Jew, Yeshua, and so why don't you wash your hands? So Yeshua did not teach his disciples to follow the Torah according to the teachings of the Pharisees or the rabbis or the oral law. And, and this is where we get into issues on the Sabbath, where Yeshua would, would tell the man that he healed on the Sabbath, take up your bed and walk. According to the oral law, that if you carry something on the Sabbath, you violated the Sabbath. But nowhere in the written text does it say you're not allowed to take up your bed and walk. And then it says one place where it says he, 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 he took from the ground uh, and, and he healed. Well, to the, ra to the Pharisees, he's creating something. So he's violating the law. So the, what they're arguing is the proper way to follow the Torah. And, and who, what they're contending with is the, the, the society around them. And you'll encounter this if you go to Israel. You go into a, um, a home of an Orthodox Jew, they're go, you're going to see them practicing oral law. And you're going to be in that environment, and you're going to be, you know, what should I do? You know, and then they're going to show you how they do their oral law. And so, we don't know this. We don't even have that knowledge. So then when we read, we think that Yeshua, or, or Paul in particular, is coming against the law. No, he's speaking against the oral law, because he himself testified that he follows the Torah by the Spirit. So, Yeshua's in the Torah. He gave the Torah. The people that received the Torah had stony hearts. So he does heart surgery, brings in the New Covenant, which is the Torah written upon our heart, and in the New Covenant, we're supposed to follow that Torah by His Spirit. Now, what if we actually do follow the Torah by the Spirit? How do we know that we are? We will produce the fruit of the Spirit. If you follow the Torah by the Spirit, you'll produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness. And so that's the fruit. When you believe in Yeshua and follow His Torah, by His Spirit. And the highest form of following the Torah is love. 
So the two greatest commandments of the Torah, Deuteronomy 6.4, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second greatest commandment, Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And, and love is the highest form of following the Torah. And so if you're walking in love, what are you going to do? What's the characteristic? You're going to serve others. You're going to give to others. You're going to lay down your life for others. So love is the highest form of following the Torah, but the highest form of love is laying down your life. So when Yeshua came and died, he showed the highest form of following the Torah when he voluntarily gave up his life for the benefit of others in doing the will of his Father. And so Yeshua is our example, and that's why it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, He who says he abides in Him, that means believes in Yeshua as Messiah, He who says he abides in Him ought himself also to walk, that means to live our life, as He walked. Did Yeshua follow the Torah? So should we. To walk as He walked. And one final thought I want to give about this is in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, and verse 28, Yeshua said, Come unto me all that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me. So there's something you're supposed to learn. What do you learn from someone? What they teach. What does he teach? His commandments. What does he teach? Torah means teaching. Teaching and instruction of God. Come and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So that phrase, rest for your souls, Yeshua is making a reference to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, which says... Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and seek and ask for the old paths, which is the good way, and walk therein, and you will find rest for your soul. So how do you find rest for your soul? You ask for the old path, which is the good way, and you walk. What is that? That's the Torah. So Yeshua said, take my yoke, that's my Torah, learn it, learn of me, the Torah that I live, the Torah that I teach, and if you do, you will find rest for your soul. And then he says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He just said his Torah was easy. But people that believe in him says it's hard. He just says it's easy, and it's light. I don't know about you, but my philosophy is, if his testimony is as easy, I'm not going to make it hard. I don't make it hard on myself. He says it's easy and light. What makes it easy and light? Because we don't have to follow it in our wisdom, in our own understanding, and in our own ability. It's light because we follow it by His Spirit, not in our own ability, not in our own wisdom, not in our own understanding. And so, it's Yeshua's Torah by His Spirit. It's easy and it's light because He's given us his Holy Spirit, that through the Holy Spirit, we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. So I pray the message has been a blessing to you. And from this, you can see Yeshua in the Torah, that He gave the Torah. And the new covenant faith is to follow His Torah by His Spirit, because Yeshua said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Shalom.